Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian here at the Excel Center in London where we're covering the DSCI trade show, one of the world's greatest gatherings of air, land, sea, cyber, and security systems. We're covering the show in partnership with DSCI and Clarion Events, and we have with us uh, retired Royal Air Force Air Chief Marshal Brian, Sir Brian Burridge. Uh, you retired about uh, in 2006 uh, from uh, RAF uh, Strike Command. You spent uh, a decade at Leonardo, uh, but we're talking to you in your capacity involved in the Defense Growth Partnership, sure. um, and you are at the Defense Solutions Center, which is at uh, Farnborough. Uh, talk to us a little bit about uh, Sir Brian, about the, the Defense Growth Partnership, sort of explaining it to sort of a lay audience that, yeah. that's not, because some of our folks really? in America, you know, well, Brits understand it well, but some of our folks in America don't. And the role that you guys in the Innovation Center play in this utterly critical piece of the UK, uh, UK's defense strategy, if you will. Sure. If we go back about four years, we began to recognize in this country, in the defense sector, that um, domestic acquisition policy was beginning to move in a direction that may see us getting more stuff off the shelf on the global market. We therefore recognized we needed in the domestic sector, we needed to up our game, we needed to export more, we needed to be uh, better at performance in the international environment. So um, we started to think, well, how might we do that? Six of us had dinner one night, because we felt we weren't making any progress, and like all good things, that's where progress is made. And we said, we are going to do this. And we recognized after um, a considerable amount of discussion with then the Department of Business and the Ministry of Defense that uh, we could get the government behind this and we could find it was a win-win because we could increase our export output thereby guaranteeing uh, the sustainability of the sector. But more particularly, we would have the motivation to create intellectual property onshore. So as you look at that, you say, well, what are the tools you need to be able to do that? And uh, strategically, I guess the first thing is to say, well, how are we going to be competitive in the, uh, in the international market in a way that we are, or what do we need to do that we're not doing now? first thing I think we recognize is we need to be talking to our customers at the strategic horizon beyond five years, looking at and discussing with them what their capability needs would be in terms of performance as much as anything out there in the slightly more distant future. The, the problem is when a nation produces a requirement, that's when the competition begins. Mm -hmm. But what we wanted to do was have uh, situations where we could have quite deep conversations with nations to say okay yeah we get where you're going now but um, where are you thinking going in the future well, you know what's your view on autonomy what uh, degree of um, persistent ISR do you think you're going to need and so how do we actually do that and how do we take something to market that's um, got real competitive advantage we looked upstream, first of all, to say, look, we've got five of the top universities in this country in technology and engineering for both teaching and research. We have a fantastic research base here. We have a great science ecosystem supported by government. So how do we get that technology to market? How do we know how to develop it to meet those needs of future customers? So we determined we needed to do two things. We needed to do capability roadmaps, which would answer those questions that overseas customers had. And we need to do the technology roadmaps that deliver that capability. But that's all fine and dandy, but um, getting technology across the valley of death has been a constant challenge. So one of the first things we did is said, well, okay, we need a technology hub in the Defense Growth Partnership. That's what developed into the Defense Solutions Center. And the Defence Solutions Centre initially, we figured, needed to understand how to get the technology across the valley of death. There are two things that slow it down. One is the management of intellectual property. Some of this comes out of universities who are um, not necessarily savvy at the way they can protect their intellectual property. The other thing is finance. And to small creators of technology, be they a university or an SME, being able to be alongside the primes, then that opens uh, one funding stream, 
And of course, once you have a unified brand, you can talk to venture capital and that brings in another. So that's essentially what we've done. And uh, in the Defence uh, Solutions Center, which is just one of the, uh, the work streams, as it were, in the Defence Growth Partnership, we have a, uh, a three pillar strategy, focus on the customer. So we have a significant amount of effort being put into the analysis of the international market, international requirements and capability terms, then develop capability based on that and the technology that we know is out there or starting to be out there. And we have eight, um, eight capability work streams running at the moment. We've baselined the totality of the UK industrial capability in those uh, areas of capability and turn them into roadmaps aimed at what we learn about the markets. And then lastly, innovation, the big topic now. Everywhere you go in someone's defense sector, government or industry, you hear innovation. And I've just seen over the weekend, DARPA and DIOX have published their view of the, uh, the future technologies. It's exactly consonant with ours. But we are interested in producing the agility with relatively small amounts of money to develop these things and to bring in these unfamiliar sources of investment. So that's what the Defence Solutions Centre does and it, it, in a way it, it, it's a bit like DARPA, only you know, typically scaled down. Um, it is supported by government and we match fund that in industry with the um, with the addition of secondees. So some of the brightest and best of industry come and work with us for a couple of years at the coalface, get an understanding of the international market, get an understanding of their peers, get an understanding of what's upstream. Um, so that's the DFC in a nutshell, the Defense Solutions Center. Um, let me um, ask you about um, where you guys are putting your investment resources. Um, one of the criticisms is the UK doesn't invest as much in uh, technology and innovation. I want to get to that question, uh, particularly as the EU's Horizon 2020 fund starts to pick up. Um, you and I were talking, and, and in, in a short while, EU is going to be one third, you know, one third of Europe's uh, tech or the, investment, or the third largest, tech, the third investor. largest tech investor. Yeah. Excuse yeah. me, right? It will will be will be the EU, uh, and we'll get to that in a second. But from a specific standpoint, what's the feedback you're getting from defense partners? What's the kind of technology innovation systems sure. that that you know, UK is good at air systems because of investment in air systems. UK has been good at naval systems because of investment. Where, you know, in, in using a hockey analogy, you know, where do you think the puck's going to be, right? Because it's all about skating to the puck, not, yeah, well, well, skating to where the puck is going to be, right? Yeah, yeah we play field hockey here, as you call it. <laughs> um, the, um, first of all, the context uh, of the US versus the UK in the investment in defense research and technology is very different. Here in the UK, the tradition has always been to co-invest with government. So you spend a fair degree of your shareholders' money in producing technology and then hopefully pull it through to a demonstrator, which then the customer can make judgments about. Now, not all of that works. And so as money gets tight, businesses say, well, you know, what's the certainty of pulling this through? And without a reasonable certainty, then they, uh, they will back off. Nevertheless, they do spend their shareholders' money. The indigenous spend of US primes, probably 1% of revenues, much, much bigger over this side of the Atlantic. So the context is different. You know, the DARPA engine really drives US research, in my view. So um, the point then is, first of all, to use your resources carefully. And it's true to say that we have considerable duplication even within the UK research ecosystem. Uh, duplication between what government's doing and what industry is doing and then between businesses and the world. And the whole Team UK thing is to say, hey, let's produce one jigsaw and let's not duplicate. Um, so we bring the best of what this team in the Defence Growth Partnership has to offer and make a complete picture as a jigsaw to meet the customer's requirement rather than 
a picture with a few bits of the jigsaw missing. Right. So that's the uh, that's the strategy, as it were. Mm -hmm.